additionally pay attention to things that make you fail. And you know, generally speaking, that's also associated with an emotional response, you know. So if you're doing something and, and you know, you think you know how to do it, and so you're doing it, and then all of a sudden something unexpected happens, you're going to have an emotional reaction. And we'll talk more about the emotional reactions in the next class, but the emotional reaction partly prepares you for the worst in case this unexpected thing is bigger than you think it is, and sort of also primes you to be curious and to start to explore to figure out what it is so that you can reconstruct your expectations and desires in accordance with the transforming world. So this slide is an elaboration in some sense of what I was telling you a little bit earlier about the multiple levels of reality, you know, so the idea is that the thing that you see, which in this particular schema would be the computer, ha is nested inside all of these systems or has other systems nested inside of it. And that's part of an indication of the complexity of things. Now, you know, one of the things that you might think about, for example, if you're using your computer, one of the things you might ask yourself is like, why is your computer a black rectangle or a, like a silver rectangle? It's all smooth and shiny. Why is that? It's simple. Yeah, you don't wanna, you don't wanna in interact with the computer at all. You wanna interact with little pictures on the screen and then you don't even really wanna interact with those. You wanna interact with some subset of what that picture is doing on the screen. And so you're very, very rarely using the computer, right? You're just paying attention to, well, let's say the screen and the keyboard. So the computer is whatever's underneath that. And then what, what that is, is a collection of parts that are so bloody complicated that you don't want to have anything to do with them that are nested inside a whole network of things that are so complex, you don't want to have anything to do with them. And so, so you know, what happens when you're using a computer is all of a sudden it stops working. Well. Then it's a computer. As soon as it stops working, it's a computer. Before that, it was whatever it was you were doing. And as soon as it turns into a computer, what do you do with it? Well, you know, you stupidly hit the on and off button. And maybe you plug it in and, and, you know, and out or something. And maybe you check your switches to make sure that a fuse didn't burn out or a breaker go. And that's pretty much the end of you in terms of your ability to deal with the actual entity. You know, and then you curse with your primate brain and then you send it out to be fixed. And so one of the things that's, that's, that's worth considering, because this will also help us understand what happens in terms of brain function as we go along, is that as long as things are going according to how you want them to go, you can really pretend that the world is unbelievably simple. All the world consists of is those few things that you're doing in your little bounded perceptual frame. And everything else is zero. And then, unfortunately, now and then, the hypothesis that everything else is zero is radically wrong, like when your computer crashes, and then you actually, actually, for a while, have to deal with at least some of the complexity that's actually there, and that's usually extremely anxiety-provoking. So, you know, you can imagine the same situation is, while well, you're in your nice, smooth car, and you're on the highway, and all of a sudden, you know, you hear a horrible grinding noise, and smoke comes out of the back, and you're you're off pulled over to the side. Well, what was merely a means of getting from point A to B in comfort, like two seconds ago, is now a collection of extremely troublesome parts, none of which you know anything about, plus it's disrupted your day, plus it's disrupted your pocketbook, plus you have to now deal with a bunch of people who are gonna tell you what's wrong with your vehicle and maybe fix it for some completely unknown amount of money and with dubious utility. And so, poof, the car turns into that. And so it's, it's almost impossible to overestimate the degree to which we live within a world that's bounded by our expectations and desires, and how much time we spend keeping everything that's complex away from us so that we don't have to deal with it. Okay, so now we might want to think about how we do that. I'm going to show you, this is a little schema that might be helpful. So. Like, I made this little diagram of dots because I wanted to make an ambiguous figure. So, I'm hoping that when you look at that figure, what do you see when you look at it? Well, I'll show you some of the things you can see, okay? The first thing that you might note is that the thing in the beginning, the thing in itself, let's say, you can see multiple ways. It's not exactly that you have an opinion about what it is, you know? It's that you can actually see those different things 
you can see it manifesting those different perceptual objects. And that, that's a strange thing because, it, you know, how people always think that arguments are about opinions. There's some facts and you have one set of opinions about them and you have another and then you argue about the opinions till you get to the facts. Unfortunately, it's a lot worse than that because the facts themselves are often reasonably subject to debate. So, so you might ask, for example, which of the five ways that you could see that initial thing is the right way to see it? And the answer to that, and this is a pragmatic answer, is it depends on what you want to do with your perception. You know, so if you want, to, if you want the highest resolution that captures as much detail as possible, then you want something as close to the thing in itself as possible. So that'd probably be object five there. You know, if you want to know the rough area, let's say that's a map of an orchard, you might think about object one. If it's an orchard from the top, right, and you want it to walk from north to south, you might want to think about it in terms of object three. You know, and so those are different ways you can perceive that object. And then I would say that what happens at the next level of abstraction, and that's where you've got the numbers and words down here, is that you have the thing in itself, which is complex and can be seen many ways. Then you have the things you see, which are partial, sort of low resolution representations of the thing itself. And then there are words which are, at least in part, references to the image of the thing. And so by the time you get to the word, it's pretty compressed. And I, re I really like the, the metaphor of compression, you know, so, because a lot of the things you see are sort of like thumbnails. And why are thumbnails useful? You guys have done some, you know, image processing, say. Like, obviously a thumbnail lacks some things that a 16 megabyte, why have thumbnail if you have a 16 megabyte picture? Okay, but why not use the picture? Right, that's exactly it. Is that there's a trade-off between detailed representation and time utilization, time and, and resource utilization. And you know, like, like a computer, you guys have limited time and resources, and so you don't actually want to see any more than you need to see in order to get what you're supposed to get done, done. Because otherwise it's just a waste of energy. And so what that means is that your brain is always trying to figure out, in some sense, what's the simplest way I can represent this so that I can undertake whatever it is that I'm planning to undertake next. And that's sort of, a, again, from a philosophical perspective, that's actually something pragmatic. Okay, so then you might ask yourself, you organize your perceptions in relationship to your goals, and then you might ask yourself, well, where do those goals come from? You know, and we've, we've heard from thinkers like, say, Freud, who talked about the id functions, and the id is sort of the seat of primordial impulses, right? And so you might, might think about the id as the producer of primary goals or drives, and Freud did think about them as drives, so they were things that led to, you know, a relatively rigid behavioral algorithm once the the state had arisen. Now, as I mentioned before, I think that that's a flawed viewpoint because the motivational state is more than merely a drive, because a drive is something that, say, triggers a a pre-programmed sequence of behaviors. And a lot of the early behaviors thought about animal behavior in that way, right? They'd say the animal would encounter a stimulus and the stimulus would produce a response. And then the responses would get chained together. And then when the animal would, uh, encountered the stimulus again, then just those chained responses would automatically run. So anyway, so, so the notion that the drive just instantiates a sequence of pre-programmed behaviors in most cases in many cases, especially with complex behavior, turns out to be wrong. There's some limited circumstances under which it's right.